Now, does does Russia already have the technology to build and their own F thirty five? That's a really interesting question, and and I had a um, I had a guy that spoke with me in Denmark. We both spoke at the uh, ceremony for the arrival of the F thirty five, and um, he's a test pilot that had done a lot of testing, and uh, he and I both agree that you can take um, high fidelity pictures from almost anywhere now, from space, from and you can and these airplanes sit on the ramp, so you can get a you can get a pretty uh, accurate depiction of the geometry of the airplane. So, and and this goes back to one of the comments I made in the very beginning. Uh, it's got two wings and two tails, therefore it's an airplane. And if that airplane looks like this airplane, they're both airplanes. Well, in the case of the F thirty five, you got to peel back the airplane and look at what's inside it, and look at how it operates, and look at how the software has been developed. And look at how the engine operates. Um, there's a whole lot of highly technical things. Uh, many of them are, are confident or classified. Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war related topics. Today, I am really excited to have on the show with me Tom Burbage for his new book, F-35, The Inside Story of the Lightning II, co-written with Betsy Clark, Adrian Pittman, and David Poyer. Uh, Tom was the executive vice president and general manager of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Program. In that position, he led the concept demonstration phase in Lockheed Martin's competitive selection as the prime contractor in October 2001. He then led for, he then led the first decade of the program design, development, test, and production. Prior to his assignment on the F-35, he led the F-22 Raptor development program and was the president of Lockheed Martin Aeronautical Systems Company. Before joining Lockheed, Tom was a naval aviator completing the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School and accumulating more than 3,000 flight hours in 38 different types of military aircraft, which is really cool. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, AJ, and thanks a lot for having me on the show. It's, it's always fun to talk about uh, the experience of this book. Yeah, absolutely. And this is actually, this is going to be a really fun show because this is the first time that I've had a, a show that's just about one aircraft. We, we a lot a lot of times we'll talk about periods in history or the history of, of certain wars and, and stuff like that. But today's show is just dedicated to, to one machine, uh, which is the F-35. So this is going to be very cool for me. One of the first things that I like to ask people when they come on this show is if in your own words, if you could just tell me what is your book about? You mentioned the one airplane theory here, but but really when you get to it, the F-35 is is a number of different airplanes. It's it's all similar to the pilot when he sits in the cockpit. He doesn't really know which one he's in if he's blindfolded when he gets in the airplane, but they're designed to operate in different operating environments. And they're replacing about 14 airplanes across the Allied Air Forces. So I look at it as kind of a bigger than just an airplane. In fact, it's one of the challenges that we've had with the program is, is it's got two wings and it's got two tails and it's got an engine and it, it's just an airplane. Well, that's not just an airplane. It's a whole lot more than that. But um, the book started out as a, a more of an academic case study um, by the other authors. And I was on their list of people to interview. And when they came to interview me, I'd been retired about a year um, from Lockheed Martin. Um, I said, you know, I think there's a more interesting book in this, uh, probably a wider audience, if we told the human journey of the F-35 and they agreed and we redid the table of contents and redid the interview list. And the book is based on a little over a hundred interviews. A lot of the test pilots, a lot of the international folks, uh, all the program management key people. And uh, it's really their story. The, the, the intent was to tell the story through them. Um, it's not my book or Betsy's book or Adrian's book. Uh, we, we had the luxury of having a really good ghostwriter, David Poyer help us. and. Um, he was especially helpful in making sure we didn't get too deep into the technical things that a general audience would have difficulty following. So we're trying to tell the, the story with enough detail that people can relate to it. But uh, really, the, it's the human. It was quite a human endeavor to get this program from off, you know, out of the starting blocks to where it is today. 
Yeah. Well, before we we talk about some of the capabilities of the uh, the F thirty five, can you talk first about your role in the story? I know we've mentioned a few other people who who wrote the book and and um, worked on the program. What was what was your your role in the F thirty five program? I was coming off of being the president of one of the aeronautics companies in Marietta, Georgia. And just prior to that, I'd had the role of the, of the F-22 general manager. And so I had a lot of uh, current experience and contacts in the Pentagon. I worked with the same basic set of decision makers, including the, the congressional types on the Hill, too, because those, those programs basically have to be shepherded through the system, whether it's the Department of Defense or the congressional budget cycle. So, so I had uh, current experience in doing that. Um, at the time, uh, the competitive phase of the at the time as a joint strike fighter and then it became f-35 later on uh was was going through its what has been termed a fly-off but it really wasn't a fly-off it was a flight demonstration program to to verify that the technical information you were putting in your proposal could actually be verified by flight test data so boeing and lockheed were competing for that and we both had flying prototypes and we were uh, uh, gathering the data to finish up the proposals that would then be evaluated to see who won the contract. And we were just about to fly the first flight on the first airplane when I was asked to go to the Joint Strike Fighter Program. My first reaction was, I'm not sure that's a step up for me because I'd already had a big program and I'd already been a president. And there was some discussion about how if, if this program would ever go to its full potential, it would, in fact, change the aerospace industry. Um, it, it would change the number of prime contractors. It, was, it had potential big impact. And uh, so I, I said, okay, I'll do that. And I joined the program on the uh, first, the week of the first flight of the first X-plane, which was one of the demonstrators. And we went through the rest of the proposal phase, the rest of that little mini flight test program, uh, won the contract in October 2001. And then I went through this big ramp up of bringing on partner countries, uh, which was part of the underlying uh, thematic of the program. Government to government relations, we're bringing on industry partners. Uh, we're growing the program from about I don't know, 180 people when we started to thousands of people after the first year. So we had a big human resource challenge. And then I was on the program until I retired in 2013. So I, I had about 12 years. And that, that doesn't happen on big programs. Normally, you're there for two or three years, and you rotate into, on into something else, um, both on the government side and the contractor side. So, so I had yeah. longevity or, ten, or, or or tenure or whatever you want to call it on the program that gave me an unusual insight into that whole period, that whole decade of actually building the program. So, for those twelve years, did you did this feel like? Did you have any any? special like personal attachment to the f-35 did this feel like more than a job to you what, what's kind of your with your relationship with the plane itself uh it, it becomes it's not my baby but you sort of feel like it's your if your family it's part of your family you know so i've spent the bulk of my uh professional career industrial career on either f-22 or f-35 so the whole fifth gen fighter world you know i feel like i've been very privileged to be part of that I think um, a lot of the technology that we broke ground in on F-35 was um, was really revolutionary and will continue to, to show that as the airplane plays out and, and being able to work with really talented people. And, and I would say very strong leadership. You know, the, the, um, the, the, a program like this doesn't normally survive because of the complexity of it, because of the number of stakeholders, because of the, you know, the different uh, factors, the, the length of time that it takes. It has to go through many different budget cycles and political cycles. And then when you multiply that times nine, there were nine nations in the partnership. Each of them has the Department of Defense. Each of them has a parliament similar to our Congress. And, and the program has to be shepherded through that process, too. So the complexity factor was unprecedented from both a political standpoint and a technical standpoint. That challenge was was very dramatic. And I think the reason the program was as successful as it was despite the fact that we had a few bumps in the road, is that uh, we had exceptionally strong people that were in leadership positions on the program. Yeah. Well, let's, right at the beginning here, let's talk about this aircraft and the capabilities that it has. 
I actually thought your the book did a really great job at the, at the very beginning of putting the reader in the place of somebody who is uh, operating an F-35 or like in the vicinity of an F-35, talking about its capabilities. What makes this aircraft so special? It's it's a whole lot more than an aircraft. You know, as, as you, if you look at the evolution of technology, um, it, it really is in multiple dimensions. You know, one is the ability to um, hold strategic targets at risk and be able to um, destroy them if required, which requires you to have a level of stealth or, or penetrability into heavily defended air defenses that um, today's generation of airplanes just don't have. Um, the second big evolution is the connectedness of the battle space, whether it's the Aegis ships or whether it's aircraft carriers or whether it's airplanes, they, they fly and fight together as a, as a joined up um, interoperable interdependent network. So the F-35 was designed from the beginning to be a very critical node on that network. What we found out as the airplane has, has been used more by the smart people that are using it now is that it makes um, everybody else in the battle space network better because of its ability to gather and disseminate and distribute information that it's capable of getting that others aren't capable of, of doing. So so it's, it's brought a whole uh, connected piece to it. But I think perhaps the, the greatest value is that all three services and our closest allies, which are the eight nations that were envisioned to be part of the program, can now fly and fight together as if they were one composite squadron. In the past, that hasn't been the case. Even within our own Air Force, we have multiple versions of F-16s and multiple versions of F-15s, and our, our allies often would put different equipment in their airplanes, and so they've got to be quite complicated to have a, an, an integrated composite, whether it's war fighting or peacekeeping, because we've spent the last 20 years doing that, and we haven't done it as an individual nation. We've done it as a as an allied group. So the core the core group of uh, of uh, stakeholders was the uh, nine nation partnership that began it so since that time today that number is now 19 so uh, quite a few more countries have come in they'll buy the airplane through the foreign military sales process they're not considered partners in the development um, but the airplane has uh, ha has been recognized now i think for the tremendous capability that it brings and the allies that fly and fight with us are now going to be really able to fly and fight with us yeah. And one of the, just thinking about how aircraft technology in the last 50 years has advanced. Um, one of the things in your book uh, that you write is that during World War II, it took weeks of research, planning, rehearsal, and hundreds of bomber aircraft and escorting fighters to destroy one high value enemy target, such as a ball bearing factory. Uh, but the F-35 could destroy an entire plant complex on its own in minutes and never have been spotted. And then you actually go on to say, also the F-35 could have targeted Hitler in his bunker with concrete penetrating bombs. And, you know, of course, we can look back at like historical events and wonder, oh, what if we had certain technology? But I, I, it, it does paint a picture of how far we've come since World War II with, with some of the capabilities. Right. Talk talk a little bit about some of those, I don't want to call them destructive capabilities, but when when an F-35 fires on a target, what's what's happening and like what kinds of targets can it fire on and what are those types of uh, firing capabilities that it has? Well, the airplane, um, as you know, when it's in its uh, very stealthy mode, carries its weapons internally. So you're constrained by the size of your bomb bay. There's two bomb bays in the airplane. Um, and it, one of the things about its stealth capability too is that it, it tricks other aircraft and radar into thinking that it's not there, right? That's, a, that's also a, a capability it's got. The airplane uh, flies um, in a group of either four or eight normally. It's called a wolf pack. You know, they, it's not like the... the um, Two, two, two ship uh, evolution of an F-22 that flies in a different part of the sky and things like that. This is designed to, to come in a, in a distributed group. And you can um, transmit or not transmit, depending on what your airplane wants to do, because you have the ability to, to exchange information between airplanes in the flight. So in the past, uh, you mentioned some of the World War II challenges that we had. 
and even as recently as Vietnam or Iraq, or we were, we were fighting with fourth gen airplanes, you had to have multiple types of airplanes to successfully conduct a raid or an attack. You had to have some that were specialized in jamming enemy radars. You had to have some that would actually deliver the weapons and you had to have some that would were there to rescue. You can't have all those airplanes in a in a real heavily defended air defense situation. You have to have all that capability in the in the jet. So integrating all that into what really is a, a fairly small package with a single engine was one of the big challenges we had. We used to kid our chief designer, a guy named Paul Park, that he needed a U-Hauler to pull all the parts that he couldn't fit in the airplane around behind the airplane because it really is a challenge. If you think about uh, weight and balance on an airplane, some of the heavy stuff obviously has to go in the back. If you have a single engine and you have bomb bays underneath that engine, there's not too many places you can route things. You know, you can't route through the engine. And if you go through the weapons bay, you now have constrained the space of your ability to carry things. So so it, it becomes a, a, a quite a challenge. And, and obviously there's trade-offs involved as you get further and further into the details of the design. If, if the threat has been defeated and the and the enemy air defenses are beaten down, so to speak, then the airplane has to be able to carry a lot more weapons uh, externally. There's three external stations under each wing. They carry missiles and bigger bombs and bigger you know, bigger uh, payloads. Um, so it's designed to be flexible like that. Um, when you're, you know, it has it has all the systems in it that that are needed to complete the mission, and it has the ability to strike uh, deep and quick. Um, you know, with its internal carriage weapons, and then it has the ability to be a truck, uh, don't, you know, a truck when it gets to, to the situation where you can carry more stuff on the outside of the airplane. So, so it's, a, it's a flexible airplane. But the real value of it, again, is connecting everybody into the same network and being able to get information that other airplanes just can't get today. Well, let's talk about the genesis of this program then. And we don't have to go too far back. In your book, we go all the way back to World War I and uh, the history of, of aircraft, which is really fascinating. But let's just talk about the genesis of the F-35 program. And frankly, maybe it will take us back several steps, because as you noted at the beginning of this conversation, we're, when we talk about the F-35, we're talking about the, the lead up of many other aircrafts as well. But how did, this, um, how did the F-35, how did this get born? The um, the post Vietnam wind down, um, which of, co- of course occurred before the step up of Iraq and nine eleven and those things, resulted in a review of the budget process, uh, particularly as it came to expensive development programs. And it turned out at the time, um, all three U.S. services the uh, were, were developing their own new airplane. So the Air Force had one called a multi role fighter. The Marine Corps had one called Advanced uh, Short Takeoff Vertical Landing, Ace Stovall, and the Navy had one called AX. And all three were in the, the one that was furthest along was the Harrier replacement for the Marine Corps. And uh, the Secretary of, of Defense at the time, uh, looking at the amount of budget that that was going to require, said, I think there, we're at the point now where we can develop technology that will allow us to build a more common airplane. And our allies are at the same age point that we are with our aging air forces, maybe they would like to join in. And so they, they basically terminated those three individual programs and rolled them into another requirements development process, which at the time was called JAST. It was called the Joint Advanced Strike Technologies, J-A-S-T. And that was a, a, a search to try to determine, as best you can predict the future, what were the capabilities and technologies we would need 20 years down the road and can we, in fact, develop them? Lots of things were changing at the time. Computer computer processing power was going through Moore's Law evolution over every 18 months, you doubled your processing capability. And the, the requirements to penetrate um, heavily defended strategic targets, we were starting to understand that better. We had some early stealth um, experience with the F-117 and, and then the B-2, uh, but we still didn't, we still weren't able to capture you know, full fighter maneuverability. Those airplanes were black and they tend to fly at night because uh, the trade-off was less maneuverability, more more stealth. Um, yeah. And F-22. these are like the very traditional kind of, when we think of stealth fighters, we think of like the, it looks like a, a triangle with jagged edges. Um, correct? Yeah. 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 And then that's a whole interesting story too. There's a little bit about that in the book about the, the uh, evolution of uh, the F-117, which 
I, I was working for Lockheed at the time, and that was still not um, revealed to anybody. I didn't work on the F-117, but looking backwards, those to calculate those very complex angles on the airplane would take a Cray computer about a week to work those angles out. Well, now you've got that much power in your phone, you know, or your iWatch. So, so, so the whole computer process was evolving at the same time. That airplane was designed by electrical engineers to be um, hard to find with, with radar. And then they gave it to the aerodynamic engineers said, okay, now make it fly. And that was kind of the trade off on the two. But, um, but then we got to the F-22, we were able to recapture full fighter capability, thrust vectoring, you know, it's really still the King Kong air superiority airplane that's out there. But it was 10 years ahead of the F-35. So there was the 10 year gap between the design freeze on the Raptor and the design freeze on the F-35. And that 10 years was right where computer power was exploding, you know, technology was growing in leaps and bounds. And so there, there's a, uh, there was a need to review what exactly do we want to do in this new airplane called Joint Strike Fighter. They knew they wanted it to, to concentrate on life cycle, cycle costs, which drives you to a single engine. They knew they wanted it to be a smaller multi-role fighter, not another competitor to the F-22. Um, so those things sort of drove the F-35 design and development. The, the actual development of the technology was was occurring across many individual laboratories that were owned by the sensor developer, like Northrop would develop the radar, they'd have a lab in Baltimore. And eventually you bring those pieces into the integration lab, which was in Fort Worth, and you try to integrate them as a system. And then, and then the third step is you actually put them in an airplane. We had a Boeing 737 flying lab, put them in the airplane and go out and fly uh, in a big airplane in the air aerodynamic environment to make sure that all the software is truly integrated. So we went, we went from um, F-22 to somewhere around 2 million lines of software code in the airplane, F-35 to somewhere around 9 million. So it was a 4x increase in software in the airplane. And as anybody who's worked with software knows, that's that's a challenge when you get to the level of integration. Where uh, If you were flying an F-35 today, like I'm looking at you, AJ, across my computer screen, you basically are looking at a big screen TV and you're watching the movie. You're not trying to figure out who the actors are. You're not trying to, you know, you're watching the movie. So that's that's what that level of software has been able to do. It's integrated all the sensors. So you don't even know what sensor is providing your data. You're just watching the movie. So now this might be this this might this is this might be a silly question, but I wonder this about like people who work on like, you know, NASA ships and they've never been able to fly to the moon. You are a, a pilot. A, you were a Navy pilot. Have you ever flown an F-35? No, I, I, if I had a bucket list of things I'd like to do, I'd like to fly the F-22 and the F-35, but they're both single piloted airplanes. There are no two seaters. So uh, it's like, it's like the, uh, the Navy told Tom Cruise when he was filming Top Gun, he said, I want to fly the F-18. And they said, well, give us 18 months and we'll train you to be a naval aviator and you can fly it, you know? <laughs> so so sure. I never got to do that. I did get to chase it in, an, in a two-seat airplane. I got to chase the F-22 and the F-35, which was really, really dramatic because I could see, you know, we couldn't go as slow as they could and we couldn't go as fast as they could. It was quite a step up. But, well, but yeah, I would, the, love, I would love to fly both of them. So this, so the F-35, when it was... You know, if we're talking about, you know, after Vietnam, thinking about the next 20 years of, of warfare and, and where do where do our, our our aircraft need to be? I imagine that this plane was developed with maybe a conflict with the Soviet Union in mind. Uh, is that correct? I think I think the F-22 was really concentrating on that. You know, the the um, the world was still thinking in terms of dogfighting as uh you know, air-to-air combat as kind of the ultimate fighter theater. We had multi-role attack aircraft, but they usually uh, were not fighters. They they were special to deliver weapons. But they wanted, and then the F-18 became the strike fighter, with both words uh, in its in its vocabulary. So so they the need for an airplane that could do both um, was really being driven by I think force size by cost of maintaining multiple training operations and cost of maintaining different kinds of, um, of, of, of squadrons across all three of the services. So, so I think the, the thought was a, a multi-role airplane that could in fact be used by all three services with the modifications required 
to fit their operating environment, but commonality across everything else would in fact um, shrink the total investment in defense air power. You know, it would reduce um, training costs. Um, pilots today can jump from, from the A to the B to the C with no real special training. You know, you, you basically reduce the infrastructure costs of trying to maintain a commonality across the systems that are in the airplane, drives down your logistics costs, the supply chain costs. So there were a lot, a lot of effort went into trying to drive down the cost of ownership, not just the effectiveness in the combat scenario. Um, all those things were important in the, make, in the, in the design and the theory of why we we're doing the airplane. So let's move up to, to 2001 then when, when you take control of, of this program, when somebody came to you and I don't know if it happened like this, but it was like, Tom, we want you to be in charge of the F-35 program. Were you like, I don't think so. Or did you, did you jump immediately? Like what did you think when, when the idea of leading this program was, was pushed across your desk? I, I was the president of the company in Marietta, Georgia, the Lockheed Aeronautics Company. And, and we were in the middle of transitioning the defense industry in general. So I was only in that position about a year and a half. And we, we had three different airplane companies inside Lockheed Martin at the time. And we were merging those into a single company with the headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas. I was in Marietta, Georgia. Um, when that happens and the president's position is now in Fort Worth, Texas, the guys who are in the other president positions generally go looking for something else to do. Um, I wasn't look. I had only worked for Lockheed. It's the only company I'd ever worked for, um, Lockheed Martin. And uh, I wasn't looking for something else to do, but I wasn't sure I was going to land on a, in a position that I would want to, you know, to, to continue on. So, so they asked me, I was asked if I would go to F-35. They were having some particularly challenging issues with it. Um, you know, we were, we were, in the middle of uh, a lot of budget battles and a lot of uh, Pentagon discussions on what direction would the program go. And so that my background um, made me uh, pretty much the person to, to inside Lockheed Martin to go try and work those issues. You were the guy. And, well, yeah, only because I had the, I had the scars, <laughs> but they, uh, but then the, um, the chairman of Lockheed Martin came to see me and he said, look, we don't know how, how far this is going to go. These programs sometimes don't materialize in the end game like they're envisioned in the beginning, but um, it's extremely important. We had we had been the last big winner with the F-22, and to be honest with you, a lot of people thought they would never give the same give the next program to the same guy that was doing the previous one, although the earlier F-22 program was truncated way shorter than it was envisioned to go, about 188 airplanes instead of 700 or something. So, um, so I said, well, yeah, I, I, I'd love to go do it. And I don't know, maybe for a year or two years, I don't know how long I'd be doing it until they figured out who was going to win and move on. Well, we won. And then we're in the middle of trying to keep the program sold and build it rapidly and do, get the international partners. And I had, I had enough, um, you know, experience in all those areas to basically think this would be a pretty challenging assignment. And if it really does do everything they say it's going to do, it's going to have a very meaningful impact on the future of the defense industry. And particularly the future of Lockheed Martin. So, so that from that point on, I never thought about it or looked back. I just figured I'm going to stay here until somebody tells me they don't want me to do this anymore. Then I retired in uh, 2013. There was an interesting point that sometimes gets lost, and that's that this contract was awarded on October 26th of 2001, which was about six weeks after 9/11. I was just about to bring that up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Normally, yeah. normally you would have a few months to say, "Oh my God, what did we just? You know, the dog just caught the car." What do we do now? Um, how do we get organized? How do we start our staffing up? But the, the contract was signed uh, that day. And well, now, did did that uh, you and your team? I mean, we're you know a month after nine eleven. Were did did this energize people? Did, were people much more committed to the program now? How did how did nine eleven impact how everybody saw this program? Well, well, we knew that the F thirty five wasn't going to have any near term effect on on the you know the terrorist war. But um, at the same time, the U.S. really needed to build its alliances. And this was one vehicle around which those alliances would come together, even though it was for maybe a different project in the longer term. It, it would be important in building allied unity, you know, in the fight against terror. At least that's my interpretation of what was going on. And, and I think it did um, accelerate the international interest um, in the program. So, 
so we, uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 hard to say that there was a direct effect of 9-11, but I can tell you that the biggest risk on the program when we won the contract was our ability to staff it at the levels that were required, at the speed that was required. And we, that was listed as the number one risk by the Pentagon on the program that we probably couldn't get started on time. Well, we didn't have any trouble staffing up. A lot yeah. of people came to want to work on F-35 and they came from, you know, the Boeings and the Northrop's and the other parts of the world because this was going to be the big game in town, I think. So we, we were bringing on uh, averaging probably 100 people a week. Um, and that's a very difficult uh, challenge to do because you want people to come in and be productive right away since we're already under contract. And we had to figure out how we're going to bring all those people on board and, and keep a sense of unity and progress going forward while we're still trying to train uh, the, you know, the new people. And we, we had some, old, some older, well-experienced uh, engineers that were kind of the, the brain trust core. And then we had a, a 50% of our new hires had to be new college hires just to keep the engineering dollar rate down to the point where the program was affordable. And we had an interesting concept that I mentioned in a book called reverse mentoring, where the young the young folks that came in were very fluent in the latest computer modeling and how do you do aircraft design, you know, through computer databases, whereas the old guys weren't even sure where the on off button was. But they had all the experience of uh, of designing, you know, really complex airplanes. So the two the two it was interesting to watch the two. There was a mentoring and a reverse mentoring going on, and it really pulled everybody together because everybody had value to bring you know, to the proposition. Well, let's talk about, speaking of risks and problems, let's talk about some of the problems. What were, what were some of the initial challenges uh, that you had with this program? Well, if we go back to the, to the X airplanes, um, they were, their intention was to demonstrate that the, that the shape of the airplane, the design of the airplane we were building would um, perform aerodynamically as we were predicting in our proposal. But they didn't have any stealth features. They didn't have internal weapon space. They were really were um, X airplanes. They were, you know, um, uh, demonstrators. It's called a concept demonstration phase. So we had a lot of work to do to go from okay, we got the we got the winning preferred concept. Now we need to actually fill that concept out and design the weapon space, design the the electrical. We didn't want to have any hydraulics in the airplane for uh, life cycle cost reasons. So we had it's all electric airplane. Um, so there were, there were a lot of things that we had to do in the detailed design. And the, the theory was in the beginning was we'll do the simplest one first. We'll walk before we run. That'd be the A model, the, the Air Force version. And if I took the Air Force version and the Marine version, I put them on top of each other. The shadow on the ground is about the same from a structure standpoint. So we'll do the B second and then we'll do the Navy's airplane third. The Navy really didn't want their airplanes to a little bit later on anyway. And, they, and the Navy airplane, in our view, would be the most significant change structurally because it needed to have a bigger wing to slow the airplane down for landing aboard ship. And it needed to have uh, stressed uh, no, no landing gear to take the stresses of catapults and the rescue gear. So that was the order A, B, C. And then we started building. And the way you do that is you, you have conceptual design, then you go into detail design, and then, then you get to the point where you can actually build something. And we were building the first A airplane. And we're projecting using uh, computer tools what the weight of the B would be and what the weight of the C would be. Now, the reason that's important is neither the A or the C are really that weight sensitive. I mean, they take off on basically runways or use catapults. But the B version's got to have a short takeoff and vertical landing capability. So weight is very sensitive to that airplane. Well, all of a sudden, we were started projecting uh, weights um, without the detailed design, the weight of the B model was started going up for reasons that we didn't quite understand, but later did understand. And it became obvious that on our current path, we weren't going to be able to meet the requirements of the B model at the weights that were being projected. So we went through this process of trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do now? We got one airplane that's almost ready to fly. So we call that a production prototype. It was still a very valuable asset. It was an A version. You could go out and you could do a lot of the initial flight testing. But we needed to reverse the order and bring the B model forward and really concentrate on getting that design right so it would meet its requirements. And then and then we went from A to B to C to a new sequence, which was B to A to C. And that change added about 18 months of engineering 
to get weight out of the airplane. We actually got about 3,500 pounds. If you think about it, that's a lot of weight for, uh, it's like a Mack truck, getting a Mack truck out of that airplane. Some weight came back in, which we knew it would because you always, you always kind of undercut, then you find out where you've undercut and add the minimum back in. But if you talk to the test pilots um, or any pilot today, they'll tell you that all three airplanes are significantly better having gone through that weight optimization program. I think of engineers, we always used to kid the engineers, you have to break their pencils eventually to get them to stop making changes. But but in this case, um, I think every engineer's dream is to have one last pass through the design to optimize it. So the airplanes are optimized, but it, but it nearly killed the program. And it basically put an 18 month delay uh, in the program. We had one airplane that we flew and that's it for while we were doing that change. Then we got so back- I imagine that if, I don't, I'm not quite sure how, the 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 overlap between the military and and Lockheed works, but I don't know. You probably have to approach uh, some people in the military and be like, "Look, we got a we got a big problem here." What do they say when you tell them we've got another eighteen months to add to this? Well, um, actually, the the teams are made up of fully integrated. Um, you know, the program is run by a joint program office and it's headed up by a program, program executive officer who's a, a flag general officer at the. That's in Crystal City, and then we have the contractor team that's working in multiple sites, and and all of the reviews, the monthly reviews, were all being done as a group. So the government was 100 percent in in the middle of all of it. It wasn't like they're the in the middle of it. They Nobody could blame them. Surprise, you know. They knew it sure. was happening, but it, but it was interesting because we were all we were all predicting the weights of the B, and we were within five percent of each other. The government independently predicted it. When all of a sudden we realized that there's something causing this to look like we neither one of us have actually got the right um, estimate on it. So, so that, but luckily the the uh, Department of Defense um, agreed um, that we needed to reverse the change the order and we continued on. The B model was put on probation until we got it sorted out, uh, which is nobody knew what that. That's not an acquisition term. <laughs> Be put on probation, but. I guess it meant if we didn't if we didn't successfully get the weight out and get it to where it was meeting its performance requirements, that the B would be canceled, and and we felt that uh, that would be uh, really really bad for the program because um, the Marine Corps was such a strong advocate, and you know, and the the UK was buying that version of the airplane, the Italians were buying that version of the airplane, so it would have really been disruptive. And I don't know whether the program could have survived if they had decided to cancel the B model. That's that's an unknown. But uh, but today all three airplanes are flying and they're all they're all better for having gone through that process. So the 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 entire phase of development so we took us from two thousand one. How long did it take for the plane to actually um, go into action, if you want to call it that? Well, uh, it goes through a process that's called um, uh, IOC, Initial Operating Capability, and and that that uh, when it goes through that milestone. It can be used uh, in an operational sense. It may not have all the final software in the airplane for some of the detail stuff, but um, and then then it, when it completely finishes operational test, it it gets into FOC, which is final operational capability. So, but IOC is the big milestone that people are looking for, and it was about 2014, I think 14 or 15 before the I think the uh, Marine Corps was first, and then shortly after that came the Air Force, and shortly after that. Came the Marine Corps. Um, some uh, the one ally that um, took delivery of the airplanes earliest was was actually Norway, which was influenced by the melting of the Arctic. This is this was way before the Russia Ukraine scenario. But the other one uh, was one of the strategic partners, not one of the one one of the uh, initial group of partner countries was Israel, and um, and Israel is, was the first to actually use it into in a threat environment. I think. But, well, um, I'm. We're going to talk about Israel and Russia at the end, uh, towards the end, because I want to ask you about current events. But you've got like this 12, 13 year period. So weights, that was a big problem. Uh, yeah, was that the biggest problem for the whole program? I, I would say there was three three inflection points in the program. Uh, well, there, there was one uh, that there was no plan B for. <laughs> Uh, that, that was technical. And then there were the two programmatic inflection points, the one I just described where the program had to reposition some of its production money into development to do this engineering work. And then uh, a few years later, um, that wrinkle sort of shows up in your budgeting process. And the uh, Congress passed uh, in 2000, 
2009 uh, budget, they passed a new rule that required the Department of Defense to to um, project uh, budgets based on independent assessments that were done by Congressional Budget Office or the GAO instead of using the program estimates. And about 20 programs in the Department of Defense busted a threshold that's referred to as the Nunn-McCurdy. And Senator Nunn was from Georgia and Senator McCurdy was from, I think, Michigan or, or Minnesota that passed had passed a law that just said if you if you're in a Department of Defense program and you exceed a cost threshold, whether it's the unit cost of the airplane or whether it's the total cost of the program, then you have to go through an extensive review. Secretary of Defense has to validate that your program's worth continuing, yada yada. So that happened later on, and that was really the the uh, long term effect of that delay that occurred to get the weight out because numbers just are numbers. And when you replan the program and you add a whole bunch of more testing in and stuff like that, it just takes the number up. So, so those were the two programmatic points. Probably the biggest one, that, the technical point that we didn't have a good early solution for, but later did, was um, the fact that two of the three airplanes had to go to C, right? So the B model for the Marine Corps and the C model for the Navy were going to operate in uh, a much uh, more difficult environment from historical stealthy airplanes. Stealthy airplanes can operate in any environment, but if they are damaged and need repair, they have to go into a humidity-controlled, temperature-controlled environment to get all the right combinations of, of materials uh, together. You don't have that on a ship. You have salt water. You have open bays. You know, even the hangar bay where the maintenance is done is open to the elements. So we had to come up with a new way of of, um, of doing that, and we wanted it to be common across all three airplanes. So. Luckily, and I, and I don't know, I don't know whether it's luck or, or just um, timing from a technology standpoint. Uh, what was happening around the same time was the advancement of composite manufacturing. So where the skins, the the skins of earlier stealth airplanes were all metal, uh, mostly aluminum, in some cases um, other things. Um, now all of a sudden, the skin of the airplane could be composite, and you can do things with composites. You know how they're they're manufactured with a with cloth and and the ros resins, and then you build up a structure that's much lighter but much tougher than uh, metal. But you can also do some things in the composite that you would would have had to do on top of metal surfaces. You can do it inside the composite, so it becomes much more durable. Um, doesn't require you know uh, special care and feeding when you go uh, aboard ship and things like that. So mm. uh, that that breakthrough occurred around 2004, and we'd already been on, on a contract for about three years. And we had tried a couple of other ways of doing this. One was with appliques that they're like big decals that you put on the on the airplane, but wasn't durable when you got on a flight deck because um, with the engines kicking up, you know, non skid and grit and stuff that it just wasn't acceptable. So. So we finally did, we finally did that, and um, and we proved it by making a bunch of samples and going down to Daytona Beach, and building a big uh, structure in the surf, and putting these composite parts in the surf for long periods of time, a couple of years in some cases, and and proving to the Navy that um, that th this was going to work. This wasn't going to be something that was going to be susceptible to to damage, uh, you know, from the environment of a ship. So, so those were the three major major points. Um, that the program you know went through bumps in the road and every program has them and when you're bringing this many technologies on at the same time there's going to be risks that you find out when you start integrating them that you didn't know when you were you know doing the conceptual design yeah. part of it well what are some of the things that that you can share that even the most well-read f-35 enthusiasts would be surprised to learn in this book there's a couple of really inter interesting ones i think that people don't normally think about. And one is the ejection system. Uh, you know, once we got into the to the F-35 era, the pilot population now uh, expanded by a considerable amount, mostly on the low end. You know, ejection seats historically have been limited to about 150 pound to 230 pound nude weight because the rocket blast required to get somebody out of the airplane would handle that weight range. Now, all of a sudden, we're going down to 100 pounds, and that's to accommodate females and lightweight Asian males that would be flying the airplane. Well, you don't want to have a rocket blast that's going to hurt the small person, and you don't want to have one that's going to leave the big guy in the airplane. So you have to go to a, a graduated rocket uh, type of capability. 
And the smaller person also had a second issue that we've discovered during the, during the testing that their neck loads, particularly the strength of the muscles in the neck are not uh, near as strong as, um, it's almost like an exponential thing instead of a linear thing, as the larger pilots are if they eject in at high speed and get a, a high wind blast. You no longer have the face curtain that you pull over your face like we used to do. You know, now it's just boom, you're gone. So, so uh, Martin Baker was the ejection seat manufacturer. They they are very 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 good, and they um, did an extensive amount of testing to develop escape system that would do that. Further complicating that challenge was the in the B model. There's a lift fan that rotates in the horizontal plane right behind the cockpit that's connected to the main engine. And only when it's in the vertical landing mode um, does that does that connection take place. But if you're in the hover and the shaft should happen to shear, even though it's a very, very low probability that will, that will ever happen, hopefully it will never happen, it's never happened yet, the airplane tumbles fast and it's too fast for the human to react. So there's an auto eject where the airplane sensors can sense that tumbling and eject the pilot before uh, before the airplane hits the ground. So. That's when you're in a And that's up. something most people don't know. Right, right. So the, 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 right. the ejection seat, the, the pilot escape uh, mechan- uh, process was really a complex one uh, driven by that. The other one uh, that I like to talk about is the Catbird, which is a was a 737 being flown by Indonesian Airlines that we went and found. It had a low time on it. And it became the most heavily modified 737 in the world because we, we basically made it into an F-35. If you walk in the airplane about where first class is, there's a, a real F-35 cockpit. The pilot gets in in his flight suit. He's not flying the 737. He's flying the controls and sensors that are in the cockpit. But sitting behind him are, uh, I think it's 12 uh, engineering stations where you can look at the individual sensors and, and you can look at the integrated sensors that he's operated. So in essence, and we, we modified the 737 from a geometric standpoint, so that the relationship between the nose radar and the leading wing, it's a little winglets on the airplane, there's pictures of it in the book, uh, are exactly the same as the F-35. So in fact, it can fly, if you didn't know it was 737, it can fly in a flight of F-35s and it's an F-35. That was really required because of the level of uh, software fusion we were trying to get. And you, you have to get the centers in the air, airborne environment to really be able to, to get that software where you want it to be. So that was another, I think, example that most people don't think about. Now, if you're on the ground in, I mean, obviously, maybe like a low flying F-35 or one, can you can you tell from the ground that, that this is an F-35 flying besides the fact that it would be in like a group of eight? Is is it that distinguishable from other aircraft? I, uh, I live right now, I'm sitting in Florida, right? In a, and I'm halfway between... Uh, Tyndall Air Force Base in Panama City Beach and Eglin Air Force Base in Destin. And the F-22s are at Tyndall, the F-35s are at, uh, so it's a perfect place for me to be. I can sit on my porch and I hear a loud noise and it's coming from that direction. It's an F-22, it's that direction, it's F-35. Can you distinguish the noises? I once, I was at a uh, barbecue once in the D.C. area and a guy was there, he was um, a Marine on uh, Marine One, the President's helicopter. And we're all sitting around the, the campfire and um, he's like, everyone be quiet. He's like, he's listening. He's like, I hear it. I hear Marine One. And he pointed and there, sure enough, was Marine One. It had a very distinct sound to it. Yeah, um, yeah. Can you can you distinguish the sounds? You can. I mean, I, you can if you listen long enough, you know, but but um, but airplanes have one level of noise when they're in military power and a whole other one when they're in afterburner. So if you took an F-16 in afterburner and you took an F-35 in military power, that you know, that there's no real difference. Noise was a big challenge for uh, in the early days of the program because nobody really understood it, but it's a physics thing. You know, the air comes in this, this end and it goes out this end and, and it, the noise is generated by the um, amount of speed that the air gathers as it goes through the engine. But you can't, I, I, I can tell when an F-35 is flying over, um, they usually at fairly low altitude. Now, if they're up at normal altitude, you know where they would normally fly up in the 35, 38,000 foot level, you probably wouldn't be able to tell. But if they're low, you can tell. And part of the reason- And are is, they grouped together when they fly or do they actually fly pretty far apart? Tactically, they fly pretty far apart, much further than we ever did in, in the past when I was flying airplanes. You were always pretty much in visual sight of the guys you were flying with, and that's no longer required because you have uh, data- 
uh, stream connections where you can see where everybody else is on your screen, which is which is a real tactical uh, advantage for the airplane. So, but uh, but the but the thrust of the of the single F thirty five engine is is uh, almost exactly the same as the two engines on an F eighteen. So it's a much you know it's a much bigger uh, engine. So. And then the noise is somewhat directional based on the shape of the airplane too. There, there's a lot of a lot of care goes into the shaping the airplane from a stealth standpoint. And so the, the noise tends to be somewhat directional. If an airplane flies over, you'll hear a little more noise coming when he's past you than you do when he's coming towards you. So, but yeah, I th- you can you can sort of tell if you listen to him enough. Uh, what you and then you can visually see whether whether you're right or not. <laughs> Well, what would you say um, from the the entire program, the entire time you were there? What would you say your proudest moment was? Oh boy, you know I'm a Navy guy by background, and so um, I really wanted the airplane to be a super Navy airplane. In other words, handle handling qualities around the ship, um, the ability to land it precisely every time you come in to land, stuff like that. And we started off a little bit rocky. We didn't we didn't really understand the impact of stealth on a tail hook. If you think about it, the tail hook has to be hidden. So it has to come up inside the airplane and doors have to close. And you use it, if you're aboard ship, you may use it three times a day. So it's got to be repeatedly used, you know, on the other two airplanes, the, the A model has a hook, but you'd only use it if you were an extremist and lost your brakes and we're going to overrun or something. So you might use it once and then you can, you can repair it, you know, uh, but on a Navy ship is not the same, but, but because of that, it's got a relatively short hook. If you look at an F-18, it's got a long hook. You know, and the reason for that is uh, the proximity. This is going to get a little bit complicated now, but I'll do it real quick. The proximity of where the tail hook hits the flight deck and where the main landing gear roll over the wire, that's much shorter on an F-35 than it is on an F-18. So the, wire, the wheels roll over the wire. The wire creates a harmonic. The hook misses the wire. So we, our initial tests were not good, and um, and the Navy wasn't happy with it. And we weren't happy with it either. Our final test, by the time we finished fixing everything, you know, correcting everything and making it fly, it's now the most uh, repeatable. They, they're wearing out the three wire, and they're wearing out a point in the in the flight deck because the airplane is so accurate in, on where it lands now. So, so I think I think my proudest moment, which kind of went under the radar for most people, was the fact that that the airplane is really really good around the ship. And and that was always the Navy's fear. You get a stealthy airplane, I think, on the ship, it'd be hard to take care of, you know, and probably wouldn't have real good flying qualities because of the compromises made to, for stealth. Well, that's not the case. The airplane really is a good, it's a great Navy airplane, I think. That's great. Well, let's transition a little bit and talk about some current events. Let's first, let's talk about Russia. I'm, I'm curious just to know, so what's what's the story with the, the F-35 and the Russia-Ukraine conflict? I'm curious. I'm, well, as far as I know, we're not supplying F-35s. Um, some countries have committed to supplying F-16s to Ukraine. I guess first, why is Ukraine asking for F-16s and not F-35s? And then, what's like the larger role that the F-35 is playing with Russia, Ukraine? Well, let me talk about um, the, the strategic piece of it first. Uh, when when the when the uh, ice cap started melting. We, we had already had uh, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands were already partners on the program. Canada was the other one. And if you look at one of the things that, that I think this airplane is going to do, which hasn't, I don't think any airplanes ever done before, is it's been instrumental in realigning alliances. I think with the melting of the Arctic, there's going to be an Arctic alliance that's formed eventually, whether it's formal or informal. And that's that's Canada. Um you know, all the countries, all the countries that surround the Arctic. And, and since Russia invaded Ukraine, Finland, uh, Switzerland, uh, finally Canada, Canada's one of the original partners, but they hadn't committed to buy the airplane. It got wrapped up in all their internal politics, but they have committed now. So pretty much every country that rims the Arctic now is going to be uh, an F-35 operator. Um, a lot of that was driven by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the fact that the countries uh, just hadn't made a decision politically on what they wanted to buy, and all of a sudden they're in the queue for F-35s. That's, a, that's an issue because then the, then the question comes, how long, when can you get them? Because we're pretty much building them at, at the capacity of the plant right now. So, but, but they're in there now. So there's, like I mentioned in the beginning, there's 19 countries that are now part of the project. 
and um, and pretty much the Balkans up there are, are, are lined up. As far as Ukraine goes, Ukraine operates um, a very small uh, air force, mostly Russian airplanes right now, with MiGs, and, and they're not they're not a modern air force. They have a very sophisticated air defense system, as does Russia, which is why you're not seeing an air war in Russia, Ukraine. You're seeing a tank war. Uh, neither one could survive the air defenses that each one has. But the real long term, and th- this is me giving you my impression now, I'm not speaking for anybody. Sure. Uh, the real long term uh, strategy is to make, uh, I think, to make Ukraine uh, a valid member of NATO. And the NATO standard uh, Air Force air- airplane is the F-16. And these countries that, that are already flying, uh, I just got back on the 1st of October from Copenhagen for the arrival of the first uh, Danish F-35. Norwegians have several of them, I don't know how many they have exactly, but they have enough to have a good operating force of them. So as those countries transition to the F-35, they're sunsetting their F-16s and their F-16s are now available to bring Ukraine up to a NATO, sort of a NATO common standard. Uh, eventually, um, if that all happens and Ukraine becomes a, a strong member of NATO, they would probably be eligible for F-35s. But right now, there, there's um, enough people in the F-35 program, I think, for a while that uh, that they're not really pushing it on others right now. Nobody's really pushing it. They all kind of want to have their Air Force upgraded because of the threat that's there. So I think that's more. it's more of a, a positioning in Ukraine to eventually, in the next couple of years, become a, a full-fledged member of NATO. That that's so, proved they're not a member of NATO today, sure. uh, but that's where I would see it going. So the the reasoning for wanting F 16s instead of F thirty fives is would be to more align with what a normal NATO country would have. It it's not for any kind of tactical reason. You would say correct, correct. Yeah, and and I also think that that there's a lot of diplomatic issues that yet to be done. Like who, who's going to train pilots? Who's going to train maintainers? Where are you going to base the, the F sixteens? Where are you going to base the airplanes? Uh, you can't have them all on one base with the war going on. So so there's a lot of questions that are yet to be ironed out. Denmark and the Netherlands have both publicly announced they're going to donate, um, I think the number is 48 total F-16s. But they won't be ready. You have, this, you have the second issue of making all, sure all those F-16s are the same. You don't want to manage an Air Force that's got multiple configurations of F-16s. So, so there's a lot to, yet to be worked out. But um, But that's where I would see it going. Now, does does Russia already have the technology to build and their own F thirty five? That's a really interesting question, and and I had a um, I had a guy that spoke with me in Denmark. We both spoke at the uh, ceremony for the arrival of the F thirty five, and um, he's a test pilot that had done a lot of testing, and uh, he and I both agree that you can take um, high fidelity pictures from almost anywhere now, from space, from and you can, and these airplanes sit on the ramp, so you can get a, you can get a pretty uh, accurate depiction of the geometry of the airplane. So, and and this goes back to one of the comments I made in the very beginning. Uh, it's got two wings and two tails, therefore it's an airplane. And if that airplane looks like this airplane, they're both airplanes. Well, in the case of the F thirty five, you've got to peel back the airplane and look at what's inside it, and look at how it operates, and look at how the software's been developed. And look at how the engine operates. Um, there's a whole lot of highly technical things. Uh, many of them are, are confident or classified <clears throat> that make the F-35 and F-35 that go way beyond what the design looks like. Whether uh, the Soviet Union or, or China or anybody has the ability to do what's under the skin is the big question mark. And the second point is that um, the U.S. has a very unique capability of being able to manufacture these really complex machines at relatively high production rates. So far, that has not been the case in uh, certainly in Russia. Uh, they may have 10 airplanes that they can actually fly where we're producing 150 a year. That's one every other day, every other manufacturing day goes out the factory. So being able to manufacture and populate an Air Force with large numbers of airplanes is something that's somewhat unique to the United States right now. What's like the... How- as far as like Russia's air force compared to the United States, how many, what's the plane, what's the differential, what's the difference in planes? How many planes does Russia have compared to what, what the U S military has? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't really answer the question accurately. Um, I, I think if you, if you look at generations, they've got plenty of airplanes that can fly and 
fight in the with the older generation, you know, the F-18, F-16 group, which populates most of most of the air forces of the world right now. Whether they have um, the ability to produce um, the more capable quasi fifth gen airplanes or not uh, kind of remains to be seen. Everything I've read says they don't have very many of those and they've been working on it for about 10 years now. So they just haven't been able to produce them in large quantities. You know, I should have asked this at the very beginning, but is the F-35, would you say that's the the best military aircraft in the sky today? That's another question I get all the time, which is kind of interesting because I was because of my F-22 and F-35 background. And, I, and my answer to that is um, the F-22 was built as an air superiority fighter. If you're going to get into um, a visual fight, you want to be in an F-22. It's King Kong. Okay. It also has tremendous capability from a sensor standpoint, but it is a little bit older, you know, 10 years gap. Now it's, it's continued to upgrade as it's gone through time, but F-35 had the, the advantage of having a clean sheet to start with 10 years further along in the technology world. If you want to go in and attack uh, a heavily defended strategic target and escape alive, um, F-35, um, F-22 and F-35 can both do that mission. F-35 probably does a little bit better. If you want uh, something that can be produced in broad scale and populate the Allied Air Forces along with our all three services, only the F-35 can do that. So they, they're both, and I guess that's a long way of saying it, it all gets down to your requirements, you know, and, and how well did you define the requirements of what you want the airplane to do? And then uh, the one thing that um, every every modern tactical airplane has to worry about is how do you deal with changing requirements going forward? You know, we're 20 years into the F-35 now. What's different today than when we first envisioned the airplane 20 years ago? So So would would you say if given the choice between the F-22 and the F-35, do you think Russia would be like, we want the F-22 or you think they'd be like, no, let's, we we want the F-35. I don't, I don't really know how they would define their requirement. You know, I think that a lot of it is um, show of force and, you know, visual. Uh, can, you know, I think I think F-22 may be preferred by some just because it's recognized as being a fighter, you know. and uh, But the real the real battle is not uh, it's not in the phone booth with two airplanes and a knife fight in a phone booth, as they used to say. It's really uh, more now. Um, if I if I see you and you don't see me, I have a tremendous advantage over what you do and where you go, and how you end up. Um, both F twenty two and F thirty five have that embedded in them based on their stealth designs. Um, but I think there's a there's a certain uh, macho, um, you know, uh, image that comes along with being in the best air to air superiority fighter, and there's a certain capability that. You, that can be exploited in the in the F thirty five. That the F thirty five. Well, well, let's let's transition to Israel, which, as of us recording this today, so October twenty twenty three, you know, a major conflict has broken out between Israel and Hamas. I think today, a few hours ago, I heard in the news that Israel either is just about to invade the Gaza Strip or they already have. So, you, of course, we're seeing images of, of airstrikes in Gaza on, on the news. Israel has the F-35. When we see airstrikes in Gaza, are those coming from F-35s? Uh, I don't know. They haven't, they haven't said. But they, ha- they also operate F-16s. Um, I, I spent quite a bit of time in Israel during, during the days of the F-35, and I went down. There's a base in the very southern region, um, not far from where they're playing today, it's called Base 25 in the Ramon Valley. And uh, I went in there and briefed all the um, F- Israeli pilots on the F-35 program and that were stationed there. And, and there was an F-16 ready to go 24-7 there because it's so close to the southern border and you don't have time to react unless you have somebody on alert. Um, so so there, you know, I, I, there's a whole bunch of questions that I think everybody has about how this uh, Hamas invasion happened with that many people coming over a border that's so highly surveilled. And I don't know the answer to that question, but it's, it's almost like we've gone backwards. We've got, we've got, you know, sophisticated air defense systems. We've got uh, leading front edge fifth generation fighters and we got tractors knocking down fences and people running over the border, you know, 
So this is this is not going to be an air war. Hamas doesn't have any airplanes, but other than maybe some Iranian drones. But this is going to be, um, you know, things are going to be falling from the sky, from the sense that it's going to be an air war, but it's not going to be an air combat war. What 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 role do you think that assuming that F thirty fives are being used first? I guess like what would the the advantage of using an F thirty five over an F sixteen be in this situation? But if F-35s are used, what do you think their primary role would be? I, I think in, in, in most, uh, well, I, I think, I, mean, I really don't know, but I think they, uh, either one could be used to, to drop ordnance on targets. And, and they, I heard they had something like a thousand targets, so they may need to operate the whole Air Force to do that. But there wouldn't be much difference because you're not asking them to go into a heavily defended target area. So you could use either airplane. Um, I do think that the um, F-35 can provide a, a surveillance and um, electronic warfare uh, information gathering capability that other airplanes can't provide and, and provide that back to the um, air combat center that's kind of managing the war. Uh, it has nothing to do with with the kinetic side of dropping ordnance or anything else. It's just its, its ability to scoop up information and provide that to other sources. So it may have a role in both areas, but again, I'm speaking completely out of, out of, um, out of lack of knowledge of what's actually happening there. Sure. I well, have, I mean, yeah, I it's friends, real time. I have some friends there, and I, and I, I, the first thing I did was I sent them a message. People that are, that are uh, worked with me on F-35 over there to see if they're all okay, and and uh, there's it's a it's a rough place right now. I mean, it's they're they're okay because they're a little further north, um, sort of up towards Haifa, but uh, but now there's. There's another group, Hezbollah, I guess, is is uh, manning up the northern border. So they may be fighting on two fronts before too long. It's a pretty scary situation, not just for Israel, but for the whole world right now. Yeah, absolutely. And thinking about how more players in the Middle East could just keep getting sucked in to this conflict, and you know, with in Iran too, yeah, kind of playing a role here. It is a very, uh, very um, delicate situation. Well, kind of lastly here, Tom, uh, and thank you so much for all your your insightful and thoughtful answers to all my questions. It's really been a terrific interview. Lastly here, what do you think the future is for the F-35? Do you think this is going to be, do you think the F-35 is just now entering like its best years? Like what's yeah. uh, what's on the horizon for this, this program? I think the real... Um, uh strategic benefit of the F-35 concept hasn't even begun to be realized yet. So, and I'll tell you, give you a couple of examples. One is the Arctic. We've talked about that a little bit. Now you have the countries that are in the Arctic can fly as an interoperable air force. Um, the other hotspot is the uh, Pacific, the uh, um, South China Sea. And if you look over there, you have Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Australia, and any U.S. supercarriers that are deployed to the region, and if that if that region gets hotter with Taiwan, China type activity, there'll be a couple carriers there. That's a formidable air force that can can fly and operate together as a unified uh, force. So so suddenly um, you're going to be at the point, and I don't think the tactics have been fully developed yet. You're going to be at the point where it doesn't matter whose insignia is on your airplane, even what services insignia is on your airplane. When you go into the fight, you're you're a force multiplier. You have you have all of these capabilities, and you are able to share um, strategic um, challenges. You know, where in the past you basically had a limited number of allies that could go into a heavily defended area, and then when the threat was beaten down, others could come and participate. Now you have kind of a unified force. So at the end of this year, there was projected to be about a thousand F-35s out there flying in about ten or eleven countries. Uh, the ultimate is three or four times that. So um, uh, one other um, re really interesting example was the Queen Elizabeth. There's a good bit in the book about the UK, which is a really interesting piece of the story. But the Queen Elizabeth class carrier was built just for the F-35. And if, if, if you, you can almost think of it like the Catbird, the 737, it's an F-35 that's on the sea. And it deployed its maiden cruise, uh, went to Syria in 21, so almost two years ago now. And it had uh, two squadrons of U.S. Marine Corps F-35Bs on it and one squadron of RAF 
F-35Bs. And the reason for that was the RAF hadn't had enough airplanes delivered yet to fully populate the ship. So the Marine Corps lent them two squadrons. They went to, did their first combat tour in Syria. And as they're coming back through the Mediterranean, the Italian F-35Bs flew out and landed on the ship. So on a, on a single day in the Med, you had uh, F-35Bs being operated by three sovereign nations on a capital ship that didn't belong to the U.S. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good thumbnail sketch of the, of the power of the airplane. Wow. Well, I got to say, I, <laughs> I went from like knowing nothing about this airplane to feeling like I could jump in a cockpit myself and just jet off. So thank you so much, Tom. I was just joking, by the way. I know it's a very complex aircraft and I've it's never really flown to fly. It's easy to fly, though. It's easy to Is fly. it? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I'll probably, if there's no way, if you've never flown an F-35, there's there's a 0% chance I'm ever getting one. So, um, Well, everybody, uh, Tom Burbage, F-35, the inside story of the Lightning II, co-written with Betsy Clark, Adrian Pittman, and David Boyer. Go buy a copy. Go check it out from your library. What a fascinating story. And Tom, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, AJ. It's been a great pleasure talking to you.